Alice knew from childhood that she was a princess. That's what her father always called her. Her mother had passed away when she was four, and she hardly remembered her. Her father now gave all the love and care that was previously intended for his wife to her, his little princess. The girl was growing up, accustomed to never refusing anything. Travelling abroad became a habit. During geography lessons at school, when the teacher asked about the Egyptian pyramids, the majestic Taj Mahal in India, or the picturesque canals of Venice, Alice would raise her hand and say, I've been there, and I've seen it all with my own eyes. It was commonplace for her father to take her on weekend trips to the Indian Ocean, or to have breakfast somewhere in Paris. Alice was used to airplanes, constant flights and changing time zones. She felt at home in any foreign country, and by the age of ten, she was already fluent in French, Spanish, and had a basic understanding of Chinese. Her father hired the most expensive tutors for her, often native speakers. But the best school was still conversational practice. No textbook, no lesson, could teach as much as walking through the streets of Barcelona, Paris or Shanghai. From childhood, Alice had many nannies and governesses, but of course they could not replace her mother. Her father was tormented by guilt and constantly brought her expensive gifts. You shall never marry and bring an evil stepmother into the house, will you? Alice used to ask him with a sinking heart. And every time her father vowed to her that she had nothing to worry about and that he would not marry. However, he was unable to keep his promise. When Alice was 15 years old, her father met a woman. At first, they had pleasant non-committal meetings that began at a cafe or restaurant, continued at the theatre or cinema, and ended in a hotel. But gradually, he became more and more fond of his new girlfriend. He really liked Cassandra for her femininity, calmness and self-sufficiency. She was not like all those hysterical women who pursued him, which he could not stand. Cassandra was a real woman, and she liked him, not his money. Mark did not notice how he fell in love like a boy. It seemed wonderful to him that they had so much in common. Cassandra had also lost her husband a few years ago and was raising a daughter alone. Besides, their daughters were the same age. Thinking about the prospect of marriage, Mark thought that Alice would be happy to have a sister who could become her close friend. However, the conversation with his daughter was not easy. First, Mark decided to introduce Alice to Cassandra. Then, he gradually prepared her for the idea that soon he would marry. But the girl took the appearance of a strange woman in the family as an offence. During the meal, she behaved terribly, as if she had forgotten all good manners. She was rude, boorish, and generally showed her most unpleasant side. In this atmosphere of unfriendliness and nervous tension in the air, Mark couldn't find a convenient moment to inform Alice about his marriage plans. To Cassandra's credit, she did not show that the behaviour of an ill-mannered girl hurt or offended her. But Mark was furious and could hardly restrain himself from scolding Alice right in front of his guest. When he escorted Cassandra home and returned, he went straight to his daughter's room. Alice, what was that? He said icily. What kind of show did you put on today? I didn't recognize you. It's like I've had my daughter replaced by some ill-mannered boar. Can you imagine what our guest thought of you? Alice glanced angrily and resentfully at her father from under her furrowed brows. Why should it bother me? Let her think what she wants, she snorted, trying her best to keep her cool. But it bothers me. I had to blush because of you today. For the first time since you were born, you have caused me trouble. But you've never brought any strangers into our house, exclaimed Alice tearfully, her father covered his eyes for a moment, trying to gather his thoughts and find the right words. Cassandra is not a stranger, he finally said, swallowing. She has become a very close person to me. 
close and necessary. Alice's eyelashes and lips quivered. Closer than mum? she asked. Her father took a deep breath. Understand, mum is long gone from us. Yes, she was wonderful, one of a kind. I loved her very much, but she's gone. But life goes on for you and me. We must be able to take all the gifts that fate gives us. And is Cassandra a gift? The daughter asked incredulously. Mark smiled conciliatingly and put his hand on his daughter's shoulder. She is wonderful. I'm sure you'll find common ground with her once you get to know each other better. Do we have to get to know each other better? Alice asked, shrinking back. Her father nodded gently. I'm afraid so, dear. I plan to propose to her. Alice gasped with resentment and indignation. But you promised! Promised me you'd never! Her father sighed deeply and heavily. You're an adult girl now. You must understand. It's hard for a man to be alone. But you are not alone. You have me! Alice interrupted him fervently. Her father only shook his head, looking at Alice with a sad smile. It's different, baby. Alice's eyes filled with tears. So, she was going to have a stepmother after all. She didn't want that. She was afraid. And then the father finally upset Alice. By the way, Cassandra has a daughter. She's fifteen, like you. After the wedding, she'll live with us too. Of course. Alice clutched her eyes and rushed out of the room. This was too important and serious news to digest so quickly. Looking after his daughter as she ran away, her father sighed. Well, of course he did not imagine the conversation with Alice like that, but still the worst of it was over. The main thing, he told her. Now all she has to do is accept it. He tried hard to believe that Alice's heart would soften and that she would change from anger to mercy. He had hoped that there would always be peace and quiet in his family. How mistaken he was. After the wedding, Cassandra and her daughter Tracy moved in with Mark and Alice. And Alice did not like Tracy at first sight. She was too arrogant a girl who acted as if she were a queen and everyone around her were her slaves. The most disgusting thing was that her father, apparently trying to please Tracy, rushed to fulfill any whim or wish, so that she didn't feel like a guest or stranger at his house. Alice, of course, did not like it all very much. She was jealous of her father's relationship with someone else's girl, jealous of his new wife, and, in general, often felt unnecessary in her own home. She understood that her father was between two fires, trying not to spoil the relationship with her while building a relationship with the new family members. She understood, but she didn't want to make it easy for him. If before she and her father rarely quarrelled, now conflicts broke out quite often, and sometimes completely out of nowhere. The father began to complain to his wife about his own daughter, and the woman, playing the understanding, delicate wife, only smiled wisely. But what do you want? Honey, it's just the age of transition. Sooner or later it will pass. Alice knew that before marrying her father, Cassandra was not rich at all, and Tracy, before moving to the new house, studied at the most ordinary high school. She had no fancy expensive clothes or tricked-out gadgets, but now she began to act as if she were used to all this luxury. It annoyed Alice terribly. It was especially unbearable to watch her stepsister and her mother be cranky at breakfast. The mangoes brought to the table straight from Thailand were not juicy and sweet enough, and the parmesan cheese brought from Italy did not have the delicate flavour it should have. Alice knew that Cassandra used to work as an office manager and often allowed herself to snack on fast food. Then where did these pretensions and royalty come from now? The father, completely happy in his new marriage, did not see all this falsehood and contrived taste. Alice addressed her stepmother by name, but the stepsister immediately began to call Alice's father dad, and that was one more reason not to like that nasty girl. 
What kind of father is he to her, really? Meanwhile, Tracy harbored a dislike for Alice too and constantly did nasty things to her in secret. They were now studying together in a prestigious language gymnasium, where Alice had been going since the first grade. At school, Alice kept her distance, not publicizing that Tracy was her half-sister. However, their classmates eventually found out. At school, Tracy made a sweetheart of herself, and soon many classmates were attracted to her. Even Alice's best friend Juliet, with whom they sat at the same desk, became friendly with Tracy. Alice caught the girls whispering about something secret and giggling more than once. It made her terribly angry. Why would Juliet whisper to her so-called sister? And more importantly, about whom? For some reason, she felt like the girls were discussing her. Gradually, her relationship with her best friend began to change. Alice noticed that Juliet began to shun her and spend more time with Tracy. Then Juliet started looking at Alice strangely, almost hostile. Several times, Alice tried to call Juliet for a frank conversation to understand what happened. At first, Juliet avoided such conversations, but one day she couldn't stand it. I did not expect that from you, Alice. I thought I knew you well. We've been friends for so many years, and you're not what I thought you were. Alice was completely confused by this statement. What do you mean? Juliet sighed and looked reproachfully at her friend. How can you treat Tracy like that? Alice was even more confused. Yes, she and her half-sister were not fond of each other, but the feelings were mutual, not one-sided, so blaming it on Alice alone would be strange. What do you mean? Why do you pretend you don't understand? Juliet got angry. Tracy told me everything, that you treat her like a servant, making her clean your house and room all the time, that you only leave her leftovers from dinner, that you don't let your father buy Tracy nice clothes, you give her your rags, that you constantly scold her and call her all kinds of names. Alice was shocked. She thought she had misheard, or that Juliet was delirious. Where did you get that from? Why on earth would I behave like that? I'm not a monster. Juliet shook her head. Because you're just jealous of your father. You're angry that he loves Tracy as his daughter. You're used to the whole world revolving around you, Juliet sternly noted. Tracy told me all this under a terrible secret, but she did not complain. She just shared her suffering. Shame on you for hurting a poor girl like Tracy. Alice did not even have an immediate response. It's all lies, she finally squeezed out. Lies from beginning to end. I don't forbid my dad to buy clothes for her. He's completely renewed her closet. What kind of rags are we talking about? And we eat together at the table. What kind of leftovers does she get? It's nonsense. And it's nonsense that I make her do the cleaning. We have a housekeeper. Alice thought she had explained everything to Juliet clearly and understandably, but the girl only sighed sadly and shook her head. That's what Tracy said. She knew you would deny it. So she asked me not to tell you that I know everything. But I just can't keep quiet because of such a terrible injustice. Alice, when did you manage to become so callous and cruel? Alice was ready to cry. Can't you hear me? I'm telling you it's all lies. Why do you believe? Me, with whom you've been friends for years? Or some liar you don't know, who is happy to try to blacken me in your eyes? Juliet shrugged. Why should she lie? She has no motive to make you look worse than you already are. So, did you take her word for it so easily and feel for her pathetic fairy tales? Alice said it bitterly. Juliet didn't answer anything. She just picked up her backpack and walked away without saying goodbye or turning around. The next day at school, Alice's former best friend Juliet moved to Tracy's desk with all her belongings, leaving Alice confused and hurt. It seemed that Juliet had easily discarded years of their strong friendship, opting instead for a lying and jealous girl. That was just the beginning. 
Gradually, all the ridiculous rumours that Tracy spread to Alice began to reach the other classmates. Soon, everyone started treating Alice like a monster who hated Tracy and was trying to ruin her life in every possible way. Alice felt helpless as she realised that no one would believe her if she tried to explain herself. It was not easy, but Alice tried to keep her head high and not show how hard it was for her. She attempted to seem independent and calm, but inside she was raging like a real hurricane. She hated Tracy with all her heart. And then all these ridiculous rumours reached the teachers. Once Mrs. Cannon, the class teacher, detained Alice after class. She looked upset and awkward and did not know where to begin. Alice, my girl, she finally said, are you okay? Alice was surprised by the question and did not understand its nature. She was still getting straight A's, and what was going on inside her did not show to anyone. Did Mrs. Cannon really see the sadness in her eyes? Yes, I'm okay, she answered cautiously. And why do you ask? I'm worried about your sister, said the teacher with a sigh. She didn't prepare her homework again today. Alice shrugged her shoulders, which was no surprise to her. Tracy was terribly lazy and could lie in bed all day long glued to her phone or computer and never do her homework. I understand that it must be difficult for you to accept her into your home, Mrs. Cannon said it awkwardly, but you should try to deal with your emotions and resentment. Alice slammed her eyes shut in bewilderment. What do my emotions have to do with it? The teacher again hesitated, having difficulty choosing words. Understand, you should not interfere with Trace's studies. The girl is reaching for knowledge and you deliberately do not allow her to study normally. Me? I don't let her, do I? Alice repeated, stunned. Why would you even think that? Mrs. Cannon averted her glaze. Tracy told me in confidence, Don't worry, I won't tell anyone, but I still have to talk to you. I can understand your feelings, but what you're doing is unacceptable. What is it? What am I doing? Alice shouted. Why are you all talking in riddles? The class teacher looked her in the eye. You play music all over the house when Tracy sits down to study. You hide her notebooks. You once poured juice into her backpack. You take the rods out of her pens. It's too much, you know. You can't do that to the poor girl. She's trying so hard. She wants to learn so much. She was so happy to get into our school. And you, you don't give her a chance. Alice was shocked into silence. The whole thing was so wild that it was completely out of her mind. And the worst part was that she realized it was useless to justify herself. Tracy was an excellent actress who could make anyone to blame Alice for all the deadly sins, and people believed Tracy, not Alice. She lowered her head low, fighting back tears. I don't blame you, the class teacher said softly. It must be hard to accept a new person into your life, but your methods, Alice, are unacceptable. Promise me that you will change your behavior and reconsider your attitude towards your sister. I promise, Alice muttered to get away. Mrs. Cannon blossomed into a smile of relief, as if a mountain had fallen from her shoulders. That's a good girl. I'll consider it a deal. Alice was so desperate because of all these intrigues and accusations against herself that she even dared to address her father. Dad, can I transfer to another school? Her father's eyebrows rose in surprise. Why, Alice? he inquired. I don't like it there, she replied vaguely. Alice realized it was useless to tell her father the truth. He wouldn't believe her, just like no one at school. But disliking the school isn't a serious argument at all. If you actually had some valid reason, then... So your own child's peace of mind isn't a good enough reason for you, is it? exclaimed Alice. Her father touched her cheek affectionately and said, Alice, I understand that you must be tired because of the workload at school, but understand that you only have two years to study. After that, you'll need to enter university. Your school is the strongest in our city and one of the strongest in the country. 
Transferring you now to another school means cutting off your future with your own hands. Do you understand me? Alice sighed heavily. She couldn't tell her father the truth, and what he told her was fair. There was nothing to object to. Well, he ruffled her hair playfully. Shall we leave it as it is? Alice nodded resignedly and said, We will. Good, rejoiced her father. However, Alice couldn't leave things as they were. At night, she snuck into her stepsister's room. As usual, she was lying on the bed with a tablet and headphones. Her eyes were closed and she was enjoying the music, unaware of the clouds gathering over her head. When she got close to the bed, Alice unceremoniously yanked the headphones off her head. Shrieking in surprise, Tracy opened her eyes and stared at the uninvited guest. "'Are you completely crazy?' hissed Tracy, reaching out her hand for the headphones. But Alice quickly hid them behind her back. "'Listen, you little wretch,' Alice said in a clear and separate voice, as if imprinting every word into her consciousness. "'If you continue to talk about me with your filthy tongue,' and spread false rumours about me at school, I will treat you differently. Until now, I've just tolerated you silently, and you took my patience for weakness. Alice was looking into Tracy's eyes with ill-concealed rage, and saying her words through clenched teeth. The frightened and confused Tracy remained silent, not immediately knowing how to react to this attack. Well, that's it. My patience has finally burst, said Alice. Now I will begin to act. All that you said about me will eventually turn against you. What were you lying about? About me forcing you to clean, to wear rags, to eat scraps? All right. It's all going to be true soon enough. Trust me, I'm really going to start ripping up your notebooks. I'm going to play music at full volume when you're studying. I'm going to give you a life of hell on earth. I'm not in any danger. Thanks to you, everyone knows I've been doing this for a long time. Well, at least, I'll start to live up to your stories about me. First, I'll shred and tear up all your clothes. Then... Stop, please, interrupted Tracy in a frightened tone. Can we do... Without such drastic measures, I was misunderstood. I was just trying to make a joke. I didn't mean anything bad, honestly. Really? Alice grinned, folding her arms across her chest. She didn't realize that victory would come so easily to her. Tracy turned out to be a common coward, like all liars in general. I don't require you to be friends with me, Alice snorted ironically. Let's just keep it neutral. Trust me, it's in your best interest. We can just ignore each other. That's enough. And realizing that her sister was willing to agree to anything, she gave a gentle smile. Deal? Deal? Tracy mumbled. Since then, relationships with two girls have more or less normalized. More precisely, they actually stopped noticing each other. Even though they were in the same room, they did not communicate, and both of them were satisfied with this state of affairs. Tracy stopped spreading dirty rumours about Alice, and soon the good relations between classmates and Alice returned. She stopped being an outcast, and even her former best friend Juliet again began to speak with her, with ingratiating smiles and apologetic looks. But Alice didn't want to be friends with her at all. If Juliet could ruin their years of friendship so easily and believe in the chatter of a girl she didn't know, then such a friend was worthless. With her stepmother, Alice had established a similar relationship, a cold neutrality, and with her father, she was less and less willing to be frank and share anything important. Alice sometimes felt terribly lonely. Sometimes it seemed to her that she was not her father's real daughter, but Tracy was. The three of them got along perfectly without her. And Alice thought bitterly that if she disappeared from their lives one day, no one would probably notice, except for Tracy, who would be happy. The years passed and school and the university were behind them. After receiving the degree, Alice's father invited her to work for his firm to gain experience in business. 
You can leave at any time, he told her, but it will be excellent practice for you. I think it's a good opportunity and a push for future development. After thinking it over, Alice agreed. Why not? Just don't do me any favours, she asked her father. The fact that I am your daughter should not affect your assessment of my professional qualities and actions. Treat me as strictly as all other employees. Don't indulge me. Don't spoil me. Fine me if you have to. Withdraw my bonus. In general, I want to be an ordinary employee, not daddy's daughter. And I also want to rent a small, cozy apartment with my first salary and start living independently. Agreed. Her father nodded with a smile and couldn't resist adding, How grown up you are. I'm so proud of you. Alice was embarrassed and hurried to end this awkward conversation. She had not had a heart-to-heart -heart talk with her father for a long time. Fortunately, she didn't have to deal with Tracy in her father's office since her profession wasn't related to business. Tracy believed her element was art. At first, she wanted to go to the acting class, but failed. She had to go to the choreography department. She danced quite well, without any outstanding talents, but still quite tolerably well. However, finding employment became an acute question for Tracy. Finally, Tracy got a job as the head of a dance class for kids. When Alice heard this news, she only skeptically grinned. It was very difficult to imagine Tracy as a teacher, especially since she hated children. Meanwhile, working at her father's company was a bit difficult for Alice at first. The young woman set a very high bar for herself, and in the first few weeks, she was so exhausted after work that she literally fell asleep as soon as she got home. She had no energy left to undress, shower, or eat. She was ashamed to admit to her father that she was struggling to keep up. So she gritted her teeth and persevered day after day to learn all the ins and outs of working in her father's company. If she had to, she'd stay up late until there was no one left in the building but her and the guard. Her father, of course, couldn't help but notice Alice's enthusiasm. But he didn't interfere, rightly believing that, if she couldn't handle it, she would say so herself. He honoured the terms of their verbal agreement not to do her any favours. Gradually, Alice got used to it and got into the working rhythm, and her duties became much more manageable. Now she had time to finish things by the end of the day and no longer stayed late in the office. She had spare time on the weekends, and she finally had her own money, honestly earned through her own labour. Alice could hardly believe her independence. After receiving her salary, she managed to rent a separate place for herself, a small but cosy studio apartment in a new building. In the first days after work, she didn't even believe that she was really living alone as an adult. For a long time, it seemed to Alice that it was just some kind of game and that soon she would have to return to her father's house. Once she got used to the idea, she began to furnish the still half-empty apartment. Alice bought plates, teapots, lamps, new bedspreads, bed linen sets, curtains and tablecloths, and soon her home was unrecognisable. It was a pity that the rental rules prohibited pets in the apartment, how nice it would be to have a puppy or kitten waiting for her. But she had to postpone her dream of having a pet until she bought her own apartment. Her father, by the way, immediately offered to give her money for her own place, but Alice refused. She wanted to earn her own money without her father's help. As for Tracy, she used her foster father's connections and finances shamelessly, begging him for money for everything, an apartment, a car, and clothes. The salary from her job as the head of the dance class was not enough for her to live on, as Tracy was used to. She wanted to live the same way, so she turned to Mark at every opportunity, and he, thanks to his wife of course, obediently fulfilled her every desire. Alice knew about it of course, but she didn't feel envy or jealousy. She didn't want to live like Tracy, dependent on someone else all the time. It was better to achieve things on her own. Although many people thought that Alice was still being helped by her father, she didn't care about other people's opinions. The main thing was 
that she was independent and proud of it. For her first vacation, Alice decided to go to the seaside. It was the first trip in her life that she had earned herself. Even if it was not the Maldives or Spain, she was delighted. On the airplane, she sat next to a young, handsome man who looked no more than 30 years old. At first, Alice was embarrassed by such a neighbourhood, but the guy turned out to be nice and polite. When she appeared in the aisle with her backpack, he kindly offered to change seats so that she could sit near the porthole. But Alice shyly refused, suddenly thinking that if she wanted to go to the toilet during the flight, she would have to bother her neighbour, which would be embarrassing. The neighbour introduced himself as Paul and smiled widely. Alice had to say her name. "'Nice to meet you,' answered the man, with such a sincere, kind smile, as if he had dreamed of this acquaintance all his life, which made the girl blush. Alice had almost no experience with men at all. She had been able to communicate with guys at university or work, but it was strictly business. Sometimes one of them tried to ask her out on a date, but Alice always refused under some plausible pretext. She was bored. It seemed much more interesting to spend the evening at home with an interesting book, or watching a new episode of her favourite TV series. Or maybe it was the men who did not make her heart flutter. However, looking at her new acquaintance, Alice realised that something strange was going on with her. Paul was undoubtedly a very attractive young man, tall, well-built, broad-shouldered, with beautiful muscular arms that peeked out from under the rolled-up sleeves of his shirt. He was also very good-looking, with dark, wavy hair, grey eyes with long, thick lashes, a straight nose and a beautiful mouth. Alice stared at him so much that she did not even realise that Paul was looking at her, and she blushed with embarrassment and awkwardness. However, Paul did not give away his reaction. He continued chatting with the girl as if nothing had happened, and soon she forgot her embarrassment. "'Are you going on vacation?' he asked. "'Is this your first time in Turkey?' "'Not the first, Alice said, shaking her head, "'but I haven't been there in a long time. "'When I was a little girl I travelled with my father, "'but I don't remember anything. "'If you like, I'll be your personal guide to Istanbul.' He offered with a sly smile, and Alice, with surprise and joy, realised that he was flirting with her. It was unusual and very exciting flutter. I'm just in love with this city, and I've been there a thousand times, Paul continued. I'll show you all its most interesting corners. I'll take you to the best cafes and restaurants. I'll give you the best coffee in the world. It sounds tempting, smiled Alice. But won't you be bored spending your vacation with me? Not bored, of course. On the contrary, you'll brighten my loneliness. And why are you flying alone and not with your family or friends? Alice asked cautiously, trying to find out if her new acquaintance was married. I have no family, the man said nonchalantly, and no girlfriend either. I was supposed to fly with a buddy I've been friends with since high school, but he came down with food poisoning at the last moment. He had to cancel the trip, and I was left alone. Alice mentally rejoiced at the fact that her new acquaintance was single and free, but she immediately scolded herself for thinking he was interested in her as a woman. He could offer his services as a chaperone, just for boredom. But sometimes she caught glances from Paul that said otherwise, that he socialised with her not just because he was bored and didn't care whom he talked to. In his eyes shone unconcealed interest and even admiration. And what hotel are you staying at? she asked. Paul named it and Alice was surprised by the pleasant coincidence. It's fate, no other way, said Paul, looking at her so penetratingly that she blushed. Her new acquaintance had indeed arranged an unforgettable tour of Istanbul for her. The first night after her arrival, he took her to dinner at one of the most expensive and prestigious restaurants, overlooking Golden Horn Bay. The restaurant was open air and located at a great height, with a view of the Bosphorus in the evening. 
Live music played in the restaurant, mingling with the cries of seagulls, and the air was filled with the appetizing odors of food and the sea. Don't look at the prices, Paul warned her immediately, noticing her squinting warily at the menu. I invited you, so I'm paying for dinner. Hearing this made Alice even more tense. What if he now thinks she owes him something? But Paul could read her thoughts. Or maybe they were just written on Alice's face. Noticing her confusion, he smiled affectionately and easily covered Alice's palm with his. Don't worry, he said softly. It's just dinner. You won't owe me anything. Alice finally relaxed, trusting him completely. He courted Alice touchingly, and he didn't make any attempt to hug or kiss her or say any greasy compliments. When the cab brought them back to the hotel, Paul gallantly escorted Alice to her room and said goodnight, politely kissing her hand. Tomorrow morning, I'll invite you to a real Turkish breakfast, he said with a smile. Alice involuntarily smiled back at him. Are Turkish breakfast special? she asked. He winked slyly. You'll find out. The next morning, he took her to one of the old neighborhoods of Istanbul, where everything seemed to breathe history. Alice was surprised when Paul took her to a small, completely unpretentious-looking cafe. The table they sat down at was covered with oil cloth. I understand your surprise, Paul grinned, but don't jump to conclusions. Try it first. And then the waiter began to bring dishes one by one to their table. Alice only had time to blink in shock. First, a copper skillet with glazed scrambled eggs appeared on the table. Then, slice fresh cucumbers and tomatoes. Another skillet with fried, flavorful sausage. Braised vegetables, black, green and pink stuffed olives, glossy with oil. Several types of cheese. Different varieties of jams, including fig and quince. And honey. Butter. A wicker basket with hot bread, or rather, bagels, thickly studded with sesame seeds. And, to finish it off, Turkish tea. Alice's eyebrows rose higher and higher in surprise at the appearance of each new dish. Noticing her reaction, Paul laughed. Yes, one Turkish breakfast can feed a whole elephant. Frankly speaking, Alice had an appetite while looking at all these viands so she pounced on the food with gusto. It was divine, she said at last, leaning back in her chair, but it seems I won't be able to swallow a single bite for ten years. Appreciating her joke, Paul smiled contentedly. Don't worry, now we'll go for a walk. Everything will be fine with you. The young man turned out to be an excellent tour guide. He showed her almost all the historical monuments of Istanbul. He took her to both the European and Asian parts of the city, and after a couple of days, Paul even organized a trip to the Prince Islands, located a couple of dozen kilometers from Istanbul. They swam in the sea, rode rented bicycles, and also arranged a picnic on one of the picturesque hills. Alice had never been so happy. A few days after their arrival, Paul decided to kiss her gently. Alice did not resist. After all, she herself had long dreamed of it. And from that day on, their relationship moved to a new level. It became a relationship not just buddies having fun together, but the relationship of a couple in love. Alice was literally overwhelmed by hurricanes of feelings and emotions she had never known. It was both great and scary, like being on a roller coaster. She tried to chase away the treacherous thoughts of what would happen to them next. While they were having a wonderful time together, they were both clearly in love, or at least attracted to each other, but the vacation would soon be over, and they would have to go home. Would Paul want to continue communicating after returning to Moscow? Alice was very frightened by the thought of it, but she did not dare ask Paul directly. She was afraid he would find her too intrusive. Two weeks quietly flew by like a blink of an eye, and now it was time to pack a suitcase. Paul had to fly away two days later, and Alice was already sad in advance, preparing herself for the fact that he would not take her phone number or 
address. Why would he? He had a great time with her in Istanbul, but in the capital, he had another life, other things to do and other worries. She didn't fit into his usual circle. But the problem was, she didn't want to forget him. She was ashamed to admit it, not only to Paul, but even to herself. But it seemed that she had fallen in love up to her ears, for the first time in her life. From the strength of her feelings, she wanted to scream, but she did not give herself away. The morning of the day of departure was gloomy and overcast. It was raining, and the mood was just as gloomy. Alice irritably packed her things and mentally prepared for the upcoming separation. Paul has disappeared somewhere since morning, and her cab should have arrived soon. Was he avoiding her deliberately? Was he afraid that she would start sobbing, confessing her love to him, and begging for a new meeting in the city? Alice sniffed her nose selfishly. Well, if he is really hiding, then she will not look for him. When she had stowed all her things in her suitcase, with difficulty zipping it up, Paul burst into the room. "I've changed my ticket," he announced gleefully. "So we'll fly together." Alice stared at him incomprehensibly. "What do you mean you've changed it? You still have two whole days of vacation. You're supposed to leave the day after tomorrow, right?" I was supposed to, but I don't want to. Paul shrugged his shoulders. What am I going to do here without you? Everything will be empty and boring. I don't want to be here a day without you. Realizing that he was not joking, Alice felt her lips stretch into a happy smile against her will. So, really, because of me? Paul shook his head as if surprised by her naivety. Because of who else, Alice? I'm crazy about you, from the very first look, as soon as I saw you. And will we? She swallowed the lump in her throat because the words were difficult. And will we continue to communicate at home? He widened his eyes in feigned surprise. Of course we'll continue. How could we not? His face became suddenly preoccupied. If that's what you want, of course. He added cautiously. Alice nodded. I really, really want to. Well, that's great. Paul hugged her and pressed her tightly against him. I don't want to let you go anywhere away from me. I'll never let you go. That's how their romance started. Paul gave Alice flowers, gifts, invited her to theaters and movies, and took her to restaurants. A week later, Alice moved from her rented apartment to live with him. And one day, she embarrassingly reported that her father very much wanted to meet him. Dad invited you and me to dinner on Saturday. He can't wait to see you, she said. He wonders who stole his daughter's heart. I wanted to meet him too, Paul said. After all, a man should ask a girl's hand from her father, as it should be according to the old custom. Alice was speechless. A girl's hand? Do you mean my hand, Paul? Are you kidding? He shook his head. Not at all. Wouldn't you like to be my wife? She bit her lower lip. It's too sudden. I have to think about it. Paul made a fierce face and growled deliberately, menacingly. What is there to think about? We're already living together as husband and wife. You love me, don't you? I do, but no. But we love each other. We can't live without each other. So we should legalize our relationship, live happily ever after in love and harmony, and have tons of kids. Alice gasped and laughed. Tons of kids, four, or three. I don't agree to less. Paul said it seriously. I've always dreamed of a big, friendly family, but so. You'll marry me, stubborn. Alice nodded cheerfully. Yes, yes, and yes again. When they arrived at Alice's father's house and got out of the car, the road was suddenly blocked by a gypsy woman. Don't go there, beauty," she said, staring at the girl with unblinking black eyes. Alice shivered. She did not believe in all this nonsense, like predicting the future 
fortune-telling and other paranormal nonsense, but the gypsy's words suddenly made her uncomfortable. Even a chill ran down her spine. At first she wanted to ignore the insolent beggar and pass by, but still she couldn't resist and asked, Why? The gypsy shook her head without taking her eyes off Alice. Don't go, she repeated. You will give your happiness with your own hands to someone else's. What a nonsense, Alice muttered, confused. Fortunately, Paul entered the conversation. Why are you listening to her? he asked. You know that gypsies are clever manipulators. The only thing she needs from you is more money. I don't need money, the gypsy woman firmly objected and repeated like an incantation, looking at Alice. Don't go. Paul resolutely took Alice by the arm and led the way, briefly saying to her, Don't pay any attention to that mad woman. Although Alice persuaded herself that this was all nothing, the mood was slightly spoiled. However, during the family dinner, Alice cheered up and relaxed, completely forgetting about the strange gypsy. Everything went wonderfully. Her chosen one really liked not only her father, but even her stepmother and stepsister. Paul solemnly and officially asked Alice's father for her hand, and the father even shed a tear, giving his consent and blessing. Tracy was drenched with jokes and witticisms. Alice did not recognize her. You have a very nice sister, Paul whispered in the bride's ear. You told me that your relationship is not good. I had such a monster in my imagination, but she's not bad at all. Alice did not dissuade him, although she was surprised to see such a change in Tracy. When it was time to say goodbye, Alice and Paul were about to leave, and Tracy also jumped up from the table. I'd better go too, she said. Will you guys give me a ride home? I don't have a car today. Yes, of course, with pleasure, nodded Paul, and Alice only shrugged her shoulders confusedly. There was no reason to refuse her sister. All the way, Tracy continued to talk incessantly. In general, she behaved like a real chatterbox. Alice, she said when they parted ways, maybe it's time for us to bury the hatchet and start communicating like sisters should. Surprised by this suggestion, Alice hesitated for a moment. I know, Tracy said quickly, that I've done many nasty things in the past, and you have every reason to dislike me. But believe me, I've changed a lot since then. I have numerous regrets, but we can try to start over. I miss having someone who is really close to me. A sister friend. Let's try, huh? Alice felt strange, but Tracy's words sounded sincere from the heart. All right, she nodded at last. Let's give it a try. Great. Tracy clapped her hands with joy like a child. To strengthen our friendship, I invite you and Paul to my birthday party next week. Will you come? Thank you for the invitation. Alice nodded politely. We'll try. However, the next week, Alice found out that she had been sent on a two-day business trip to another city and would not be able to attend her sister's birthday party. It's embarrassing, Alice complained to Paul. She invited us with such sincerity, and I already bought her favorite perfume as a gift, and now she'll think that I made up this business trip on purpose. She'll be offended. Come on, if you explain everything to her, she'll understand, consoled Paul. You really did not know that everything would turn out like this. Suddenly Alice had an idea. What if you go to her birthday party without me? Why would I do that? Paul was surprised. Your sister and I barely know each other. Why would I suddenly go to her birthday party? Believe me, we hardly know each other, objected Alice. After all, she invited both of us, and you don't have to stay there long. You'll congratulate her, give her the present, and apologize for my absence. Well, if it's only for a little while, Paul said doubtfully, I'll give her the present and leave right away. Thank you, dear. Alice stood on tiptoe and kissed him on the lips. You'll help me out a lot. If only she could have known, then, that she was ruining her life with her own hands. The business trip was a success. Alice coped with all the work and was satisfied with her successes. She missed Paul terribly. She couldn't wait to hug him after a short separation 
which seemed like an eternity to her. She called him yesterday to find out how her sister's birthday was, but Paul didn't pick up the phone, and then his phone was disconnected. It wasn't like him at all. Usually he was very responsible, but Alice consoled herself that the celebration must have been delayed yesterday, and when he got home, he was so tired that he forgot to charge his phone and went to bed. Well, I'll scold him now, thought Alice, going up in the elevator, unable to hold back a smile. He made me worry. She carefully inserted the key into the keyhole, imagining how surprised and happy her lover would be. She wasn't due to arrive until the evening, but she had managed to finish her work early. It would be a surprise to Paul, but it turned out that the surprise was for her. Alice stepped carefully into the apartment, trying not to make any noise so as not to wake up Paul before it was time and not spoil her idea. For a second, she thought that the apartment smelled like someone else's perfume, the same perfume that her sister adored. But Alice still did not suspect anything and boldly opened the bedroom door. When she did, she staggered back as if she had been slapped. Paul and Tracy immediately caught her eye as she entered the room. Both were completely naked, and Tracy's head was nestled on Paul's chest. Alice couldn't remember how she left the apartment, how she rode the elevator, and how she ended up on the street. She just rushed forward, not caring about the road. The terrible image of Paul and Tracy, with Tracy's hair strewn across his chest, still stood in front of her eyes. The question, how could he, kept knocking at her temples. She didn't even consider the idea of Tracy's betrayal, as if she subconsciously expected such meanness and nastiness from her. But Paul, had he fallen for all of Tracy's cheap tricks? Was he so primitive that it was so easy for him to get into bed with Tracy during Alice's absence? But then their relationship was worthless. Alice convinced herself that it was for the best that she found out about Paul's infidelity now, before the wedding. It would have been much worse if it had happened after they got married and had children. But when she remembered how she and Paul had dreamed of a big family, she couldn't stand it and burst into tears. Why did he do that to her? Why? It was a stroke of luck that Alice had not yet vacated her rented apartment. She had paid for it six months in advance. At least now she had a place to live. Of course, she didn't even consider the idea of going home to her father. Suddenly, Alice was seared with shame. How could she admit to her father that there would be no wedding, that Paul cheated on her, and with whom? With Tracy. At home, after coming to her senses and drinking a sedative, Alice wrote Paul a message. I saw you with Tracy. It's over between us. If you have even a little respect for me, don't try to meet me any more. I will never forgive you. She immediately put Paul on the blacklist, so he could not write or call her any more. Alice spent a few days locked up in her rented apartment, not responding to numerous doorbells. She guessed who it was that might have been calling and knocking, but she didn't want to see him. Never in her life. She called work and told them she was sick. Alice kept to herself, ordered groceries through delivery, and before opening the door, she looked carefully through the peephole to see if her unfaithful lover was lurking behind the courier's back. A couple of times, she saw Paul's car under her windows. He had come to see her, apparently to talk to her. For hours, he would hang around the windows, calling and pounding on the door with his hands and feet. But she still wouldn't open the door. Tears ran down her cheeks when she heard him calling from behind the door. Alice, please open up. Let me explain, please. But she didn't react or give in to the provocation. Eventually, one day, when Paul was banging on the door, a neighbour came out on the landing and threatened that if he didn't stop, she'd call the police. One day, Alice's father came to visit. Daughter, open up, it's me. He wrote her a message. She opened the door incredulously, checking to see if he was tailed. I'm alone, her father said, raising his hands. Alice stepped aside, allowing him to enter. Her father followed her into the room 
and sat down on the edge of the couch, staring at his daughter with a worried look. Are you eating anything? He asked, concerned at the sight of her gaunt face with black circles under her eyes. Alice shrugged indifferently. I'm eating something, I think. She didn't really remember. Her father shook his head, looking at her with sincere compassion. You can't do that, Alice. You'll endanger yourself. Alice took a deep breath. You already know? She cautiously asked her father. He looked away. Yes, I know, and I have something else to tell you. Tracy is pregnant. She's going to marry Paul soon. I'm sorry, but there's nothing I can do about it. The wedding day came. Alice wasn't invited, but she knew the date. It was the day when all her dreams, hopes, and faith in people finally died. Alice couldn't help replaying an imaginary wedding ceremony in her head over and over again. Each time, it got worse and worse. But if only she knew what had happened at the wedding... When the wedding procession arrived at the registry office, a gypsy woman suddenly appeared and blocked the bride and groom. She stood in front of them and raised her hand, as if ordering them to stop. Everyone froze, unsure how to react. "'Honey, let's go,' mumbled Tracy, clinging to her fiancé's elbow. Paul, however, stood silent and looked at the gypsy woman with a strange expression, as if he were trying to remember something but couldn't. The gypsy woman took another step forward and approached the bride. She tried to recoil, but the gypsy suddenly pulled off Tracy's veil. The bride shrieked in fright, and the guests were left dumbfounded. Staring intently into the bride's face with her black eyes, the gypsy laughed ominously and said, "'The real bride is different.' "'What are you talking about?' asked Tracy. But the gypsy grinned and lowered her gaze to Tracy's belly. And you're not pregnant, it's all a hoax. Tracy got nervous and asked for the crazy woman to be taken away, but no one moved. It was as if the gypsy had hypnotized them. Suddenly, the gypsy turned to the crowd of guests and announced, There will be no baby. She tricked her sister's fiancé into bed. She slipped sleeping pills into his drink and then called a cab to his house. Everyone was shocked into silence, with only the bride shrieking. What are you talking about? Where did you get that from? Paul suddenly seemed to wake up from his forgetfulness and stared greedily at the gypsy. What did you say? He asked quickly. The gypsy woman grinned and said, You are clean before your true bride. With that liar, you had nothing. You just fell asleep. She undressed you and got into bed with you. No pregnancy. Nope. She was hoping to get pregnant after the wedding. She was always jealous of her sister, so getting you away from her was a matter of principle. Paul turned a fierce look on Tracy and asked, Is it true? Paul, why do you believe this mad woman? She mumbled, but her face turned red. Paul shook his head and said, She's not crazy. I remembered. I remember. When Alice and I were coming to dinner at her father's house, this very woman blocked our way and warned us not to go there. We just laughed at the prophecy and didn't believe it, but it turned out to be true. There was an unimaginable uproar as everyone talked and argued at the same time, trying to digest the information they had received. Alice's father stepped towards his stepdaughter and looked angrily into her eyes. Tracy, is it true? Don't you dare lie to me. I'll find out anyway. Tracy's eyes frantically darted back and forth. But why are you picking on the poor girl? screamed her mother. Can't you see she's scared enough as it is? But Mark only shook his head and warned, Don't interfere, Cassandra. I asked your daughter a question. The gypsy woman listening to the conversation nodded. She was helping her daughter. It was her idea with the sleeping pills. She didn't want to miss out on such an enviable suitor. Paul angrily threw away the bride's hand, still clinging to his elbow. I felt that something was amiss in the matter, because I couldn't get so drunk that I couldn't remember who I'd spent the night with, and I'm not usually hitting on strange women when I'm in love with only one. And how come the idea of sleeping pills didn't occur to me at once? On the groom's shoulder lay the strong hand of Alice's father. I am glad it is only a monstrous lie and a mistake, he said. Go to Alice, she is suffering a great deal. She is not well without you. Paul smiled broadly, at last, 
I can go to her with a clear conscience. All this time I despised and hated myself, thinking I'd cheated. And now, now I'm the happiest man in the world. In a minute, the groom jumped into the car and drove away. The guests stood dumbfounded in front of the registry office, not knowing what to do now. Tracy sobbed in humiliation, and her mother tried to comfort her. Alice's father looked for the gypsy woman to thank her. However, there was no sign of the mysterious woman. It was as if she was just a vision. Soon after the incident, Alice's father divorced Tracy's mother. He couldn't forgive her complicity in what had happened, nor his daughter's tears and suffering. As for Alice and Paul, they were pleased together and got married as soon as possible. A year later, they gave a dazed with joy grandfather his first grandchild. Now, when they met gypsies on the streets, they no longer shunned or avoided them. On the contrary, they gave generously, as if in gratitude to the woman who had once saved their love.